Praise God for your exodus. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, well, I'm not what I ought to be. But thank God that I'm not what I used to be. That's something to praise God there for right there. Go ahead and give him praise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead and give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, we're so glad that you're here worshiping, uh, worshiping with us today on this Resurrection Sunday morning. We're so glad um, that you are here with us again this morning. Hope well, can you help me praise God for all of our first-time guests again? Come on, Hope well, let's make some big noise, big noise, big noise. Hey, man, we're so glad. So glad that you're here. We hope and pray that you will come back and worship with us again. Come back and worship with us anytime, Sundays or Wednesdays, to come and be a part of the Hopeville experience. Amen. We still got people coming in. Amen. We want them to get seated. We want them to be comfortable. Amen. As we move further in our worship experience. Amen. 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 We're going to get you in where we can get you in at. Amen. We got room for you. Amen. We still got steps. Amen. God made steps, so we got to use the steps. We'll use the steps. If we don't want you to sit on the steps, I'm just joking. Amen to nobody. I'm just messing with you. Amen. Just kind of get us ready as we get ready to go um, into the word of the Lord. If you got room around you, amen, we got some seats here up front. I know you don't want to be up front. Amen. But you have first class seats to the word of God this morning. Amen. We got seats up right up here, right up front, on my left and my right. Amen. We want to make sure that you're comfortable as you're getting in and sitting. Amen. There is room for everybody. Amen. Room for everybody today at the well. And we want you to come. We want you to be here, be with us. Amen. As we get ready to journey up into the word of the Lord. Amen. We got seats right up front here. We got seats right up front, right there, right there. Amen. Amen. Uh, we want to make sure everybody's comfortable. Amen. We got like a block right there. Amen. The block is like, that's about three four folks in the right there. Two or three, to make you comfortable. Amen. And get right there. Amen. <laughs> Listen, if you follow us on social media, we're gonna go. We're gonna go live on Facebook in just a few seconds. If we're not already, Amen. We're already there. We're already on. Praise God. No one told me we're already on. Go ahead and share it. Amen. Spread this. Share it to someone. To someone that may have to work today or we're not able to get out to the house of worship can be able to receive the word today. So go ahead, get your phones out real quick. Um, as we're doing that, if you're not following us on show, on social media, shame on you. Go ahead and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Download our app, The Will of Carbondale. Spread this on your timeline so that people can be able to receive the word of God today. Amen? Amen. As you're doing that, clap your hands one more time. Amen. 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 Listen, I need your help this morning. I need your help this morning. I can't remember if it is either the second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I think it's between the second and fourth grade when you... Um, go and you raise yourself and you raise yourself to a new level of math where you're having to do how many people remember the greater than less than and equal to how many people remember that in school so what grade was that about second grade third grade second grade you start doing that second grade i got some teachers in the house second grade we're going with that so i remember in second grade math has never been one of my favorite subjects. I didn't like math. All I wanted to learn about math was how to be able to add up my money, subtract my money, and know how much money I had in the bank. That's all that I wanted to know with math. But with math, you had to learn in second grade in order to be able to advance to third grade greater than, less than, and equal to. For some reason, it did not matter the worksheets that we did. It did not matter the homework that we had. It did not matter how many times I spent time with my teacher. I will never forget Miss Brown, second grade, Lover Elementary School. How many times she would go over there with me. I still had the hardest time in memorizing great, greater than, less than, and equal to. 
hardest time. Now y'all looking at me like that. Y'all had the same time too. Y'all had a rough time too, trying to figure out greater than, less than, and equal to. But she came up with something to help everybody and all the other kids like me to learn greater than, less than, and equal to. She said, Christopher, the alligator always eats the bigger number. She said, if you get stuck when it comes to greater than, less than, or equal to, the alligator always, the alligator had the big mouth. You all know what it's like. Don't look at me like that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Greater than had the big mouth open, and the big mouth, the alligator, always ate the greater number. There was no number that was too big for the alligator to be able to get. It didn't matter. It did not matter if it was five. It didn't matter if it was 15. It didn't matter if it was five billion. The alligator always ate a bigger number. Now, it's strange, y'all. That's just simple math that we learned in second grade. But even though it's math at a different level, it still applies to life today. Maybe it's just me, but as I've grown older, there have been some things that's been overwhelming that I had to face. There have been some moments, there have been some trying times that, that was so big, so huge, so significant that I had no idea how I was going to be able to make it through or if God was able. Yes, I love God. Yes, I preach God. But stuff has been so crazy and so tight sometimes that I even thought maybe this is too big for God to be able to handle himself. Maybe it's not your bills. Maybe it's not life. Maybe it's not any of those things. Maybe it's some issues that you have in your life, some struggles that you have in your life that you just seem as if I can never be able to get over this. This thing is so big that God could never be able to forgive me of this. I think we're in good company this morning because you and I have been there some point in our lives before the things have been overwhelming and it seemed so big, so huge that there was no way for us to be able to get out of it. If you got your Bibles, go with me to Acts chapter 9 because uh, we're in good company this morning. We're in great company this morning. Um, Acts chapter 9 kind of starts back in chapter 8. It tells the story of a man by the name of Saul. Um, Saul is a Pharisee. He, he holds strictly to the law. I mean, he wants to go by the book A, B, C, D, 1, 2, point by point. He wants to go right by the book. So the Bible says that Saul is very zealous in what he does. Saul is now one who is, a, again, who is a Pharisee that has taken upon himself to go and to be able to take out, to kill, to murder anyone that professes the name of Jesus Christ. Saul, chapter 8 says, he is raising havoc in the church. This joker has the audacity to go to people's homes, not even knocking on their doors, knock down their doors, go into their homes, and he will pull out men and women, and he will persecute them, he will kill them, and take them back to Jerusalem. He wasn't afraid to be able to separate Fathers from their children, mothers from their children, fathers, wives from their husbands, and husbands from their wives. He was very zealous about it, what he did, and he did it with great passion. If you got your Bibles right there in Acts chapter 9, it says this, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. In other words, Saul was a big bully that he didn't mess with nobody but those who said that they were members of the way. That was the term that they used in the first church about being the Christian, that they were members of the way, meaning that they realized that following the way was not just something that we did, not, 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 not just an announcement that we made that we were following the way, but it was a life that they lived, that we are, we are following the way of Jesus Christ, but we're also living the way as well. So Saul is a big bully. My goodness, that candy just scared me when it was thrown, but we all good. We all good. I didn't know what it was. I was about to head out this door right there as soon as I saw, saw, saw it fly. Let's go ahead and give God praise right there so I get my nerves together. Amen. 
We all good. 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 So Saul is a big bully. It's okay to laugh in church. Oh, my goodness. Saul is a big bully, and he's going after believers. He is a believer's worst nightmare. He is going, taking them, wanting to kill them, wanting to murder them, and take them back in change. But something happens in the life of Saul. Here's what I love so much about Jesus. Elder James, that Jesus will only allow us to go so far. He will only allow us to go so far and to do, to do so much before he, interrupts, uh, before he interrupts our lives and come in and brings about a change. And that's the same thing that happens to Saul right here in Acts chapter 9. This man who was one going after to kill believers has something, something dramatic that happens in his life. Look at verse 3, y'all. He says this, as he was approaching Damascus, now he left Jerusalem, he left where he left his central location and traveled between 125 and 150 miles to get to Damascus. You all have to understand, there was no Uber, there was no Lyft. There was no public transportation. He was either going on foot or he was on a horse. Can you imagine traveling by foot or on a horse for 125 miles? All right. This shows how zealous and how passionate Saul was about taking believers' life. That even though he knew he would have to travel this extent of time, he was willing to be able to do it because he had great passion behind it. Look here at verse 3. As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, who are you, Lord, Saul says. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Here it is, verses 3 through 9. Saul has a Damascus Road experience. Okay. Now, all of us, we may have had this experience or we may not have or something similar to it. But a Damascus Road experience is a dramatic experience where we have an encounter with Jesus Christ that instantaneously changes our lives right there at that moment. For some, your Damascus Road experience may have been almost getting into an accident and you realize that your life could have ended right then and right there. And it was in that moment at that time right then that God had your under divided attention and you stop fighting against God and you stop fighting against God and trying to control your own way it was God's way it was God's way of orchestrating of using everything even the accident in order to be able to get you to a place where he had your full and undivided attention so Saul's moment, his, this was his, this Damascus Road experience, this light from heaven beams down, causes him to be blinded. It's so overwhelming, the light is so bright that it overwhelms him that now Jesus has his attention. So Jesus begins to talk to him, and what does he say to him? What does he say? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul responds, who are you, Lord? Saul asks. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. The man with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. So, Paul, so Saul, Saul picked, picked, picked himself up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by hand to Damascus. Here it is, thanks to God. Let me go ahead and be honest with you and get straight to the point, because I know somebody got some good collard greens cooking right now, got a roast in the crock pot, got a peach cobbler ready to go in the oven. So I don't want to delay our time this morning, but I want to share something so important with you this morning that even though right now okay. you're opening up your eyes and you're able to see me you're you're looking at me right now you're engaging me engaging with me right now but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ even though you're looking at me at your eyes right now, eyeball to eyeball, you are yet still spiritually blind All right. because you're lost 
You're lost in your own way. You're lost in doing what pleases you. You're lost in fulfilling your passions and your zealous pursuits that goes against God. So now God, Jesus, allows for Saul to be blind so that he can be able to have his attention and so that Saul can be dependent upon him to help him to get to where he has to get to next in life. So here it is, Saul is there. He's having to be led to Damascus by some friends. And, he, and the Bible says in verse 9, he remained there blind for three days and did not eat and did not drink. And there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Stray Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he could be able to see again. Here it is. Here it is. God is setting up this divine interruption in the life of Saul because why God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has his hand on the life of Saul and because he does not want him to ruin the future that he has in him, God divinely interrupts his life and stops him before he goes any farther. Somebody can be able to testify this morning that Jesus has done the same thing to you, not just once, not just twice, but multiple times where he has divinely interrupted your life. Be able to get you back on track and to where God, where God designed, has designed for you to be and the call and the purpose and the plan that he has for your life. So here it is, Saul, this one who has gone about passionately and zealously killing believers. Now he has been struck down by this light that has made him blind. Now he's blind and having to depend on other people to be able to get him to where he needs to get to. And now he has not eaten for three days, has not eaten for three nights. And God gives the dream to Ananias through a vision telling him, I'm going to use you to bring restoration All in right. the life of Ananias. Well, look at the response of Ananias in, ver in, chapter th in verse 13, y'all. Here it is. He says, but Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Here it is, saints of God. And Ananias is nervous and rightfully so. Wait a minute, God. You want me to do what? You want me to touch who? You want me to be in the same room of Saul from Tarsus that has been killing believers just like me? God, are you sure you got the right person? Are you sure you got the right dream for this vision? Because I don't think I'm the one that you want to be able to use. So, Ananias is rightfully on guard. He is rightfully to be concerned about his life and what's going to happen. But here it is, thanks to God. Here's good news right here. Here's good news right here. Jesus is greater than your past. Jesus yeah. is greater than your past. Here it is. Pastor. Makes sense. Connect this with the text. I just told you that God gives the vision to Ananias to go and to lay hands on Saul. He does not want to do it. Why? Because he remembers who Saul used to be. He remembers the old behaviors of Saul. He remembers what everybody in town has said about Saul. He remembers the text message that he received saying, hey, go ahead and run. Saul is in town. You better run for your life. He remembers the post that he's seen on Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook Live about, fall, about Saul being in the vicinity. And he said, there is no way, no way that I am going to be the one to go and lay hands on him and bring restoration in his life. But Jesus is trying to get Ananias to remember, hey, he is somewhere praying to me. Now, you got to realize something here. Okay. Saul was not praying to Jesus before. But when he has this Damascus Road experience and now he's blind, now he's not eating, Jesus is doing a work in his heart. Jesus is doing a work in his life. And sometimes people will not believe the work that Jesus is doing in your life. And you know what? You don't have to prove to them. You just let them 
though the proof is in the pudding, even though you don't see me being transformed, he is doing some work behind the scenes where others cannot see. He's changing my heart. He's changing my appetite. He's changing my ways. And this is what Jesus desires to do in our life. He wants us to know today that no matter what you've done, he is greater than your past. So if Jesus has gotten over your past, you need to get over your past. And if other jokers can't get over your past, that's all good. As long as Jesus was able to say on the cross, it is finished. Let me know that my past failures, my past mistakes, my past hangups have all been covered on the cross. Somebody ought to give God praise right there. Oh, that's good news that he is greater than our past because here it is. Thanks to God. Here it is. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Sometimes we allow our past to have more power in our lives than it should. Sometimes we allow our past failures and our past mistakes to be a part of our identity and we begin to identify ourselves with what we've done and what we've said. But you have to realize when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, he washes you with his blood and he makes you white as stone. You have to understand that I don't have to allow my past hangups, my past failures to identify who I am. But now that I am a new creature in Christ, my new ID is that I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. I am an heir with him. Yeah. Not allow my past to be able to be greater than what God desires to do in my life. Ananias cannot get over. There is no way. There is no way. There is no way that Saul is being changed. There is no way that Saul is being transformed. There is no way that Jesus is doing a work in the life of Saul. Absolutely, he is doing a work in this man's life transforming him, renewing him, restoring him, regenerating him, and breathing new life into him. Here's something else. Not only is Jesus greater than your past, but your past doesn't dictate your future. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you, God. Here it is. I know it's Resurrection Sunday morning, and we looking good. We smelling good. We got fresh haircuts. We got new weaves put in. We're looking good all this well. But all of us in this room got something in common. We all have a past. We all have some things that if the person sitting next to us knew what we have done in our past, there is no way they would sit next to us. If people knew those that are standing before you serving and singing and preaching and leading, if they knew what you have done in your past, there would be no reason why they would want to hear you lift up holy hands and talk to God. But there's good news in this text today that our past, no matter how crazy it's been, no matter how jacked up it's been, it does not tell our children tomorrow what it will be. Our future, let's our past though, but I'm not going to allow my past to dictate the plans and the purpose that God has for my life. It does not matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you're at right now. God has a plan and a purpose and a future for your life. And your past will only, your past, your past, your past, your past, your past, your past will only influence your future if you let it. Oh, here it is. Here, here, here's the challenge that we have. We, we have this huge challenge that we know that Jesus went to the cross. We know that he paid our debts once and for all. He said it is finished. That now we have been redeemed. Now we have been renewed. That the bill that you and I can never be able to play, that, that you and I can never be able to pay, has already been paid in Lord, full. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yes. And even though Jesus has done that, we still have a hard time in letting go of our past. Why do we have a hard time in letting go of our past? 
Why do we cripple the future that God has for us? Yes, because we, 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 we continue to hold on. We continue to go back down memory lane. We continue to talk about the same things. We continue to hang around the same people. We continue to go down the same route. When he has given us new life, new life. All right. in him. Your past does not dictate your future, but your past will influence your future if you allow it to. And so that has to be an awakening. That has to be a time when you wake up and realize if Jesus has paid my sins in full, my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins, I have to cut ties with my past today so that I can be able to walk into the future that God has. for my life. Thank you, God. Nobody thought that Saul would ever change. Nobody thought that Saul would ever be saved. Nobody thought that Saul would ever be transformed. Nobody thought Saul, a preacher, Saul, a servant, no one ever thought that God would do such an amazing thing in his life. Why? Because of what he had done. And never looking at what God was able to do in his life. Look at verse 15. So Jesus has a purpose in what he does. Now, he could have used a disciple, but he used an ordinary man by the name of Ananias that he worked through to, be, to display his power, to work through, to be able to get into the life of Saul and to be able to res help restore him and to bring him into right relationship with God. Look at verse 15. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how he must suffer for my name's sake. Wait a minute. Y'all just missed what I just said. Now, wait a minute, Pastor Sunday. You're still talking about Saul, right? Yes. Go ahead. I'm still talking about Saul. And Jesus says, if you got your Bibles open, all your app is in red, so that's Jesus talking. Jesus says, go for Saul is my chosen instrument. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mister Saul is my chosen yeah. instrument. Galatians chapter, Galatians, Galatians. Let me get to Galatians real quick. And let me read you something here that Paul says right here. He says, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says, but even before I was born, uh -huh. God chose me uh -huh. and called me by his marvelous grace that it pleased him. Saul realized, as he's making this conversion to Paul, he realizes before I was even born, God already, get this, already have chosen me to be a chosen instrument for him to be used to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Now it's twofold. Jesus knew, God knew, what Saul was going to be before he was in his mother's womb. Just like he knew what he was going to do when he came out of his mother's womb. Okay. Right. So he knew that he was going to use him to spread his gospel. But he knew he also knew that he was going to be one to persecute Christians. All right. So even though Jesus knows the sins that you and I will commit, he still has a plan. He still has a purpose. He still has a use of us to be able to use to make him famous. So here it is. No matter what you've done, there is still purpose for your life. No matter what you've done, there is still purpose for your life. He tells Ananias, I'm using you to go and connect with Saul because I need him to know that I have use of him. And that's good news for us that if Jesus can be able to take a murderer and a killer like Saul and use him to be able to spread the message of Jesus Christ, surely God can be able to use us. Surely God can be able to transform our hearts and renew us and refresh us into what he desires us to be. Yes. I think he does it. He's let everybody know regardless of his past, regardless 
of his mistakes, regardless of what he's done, regardless of what he says. Now that I'm in his life, I am greater than every failure, every mishap, every mistake, every word that he says, every murder that he has committed. I am greater than that. I told you all how I learned greater than, less than, and equal to. That the alligator always eats the bigger number. Not only does the alligator eat the biggest number, but Jesus eats the greatest sin. Y'all just missed that. Y'all just missed that. He is greater than, so when I make him greater than in my life, he eats away at all that big stuff that wants to take me out, that wants to cripple me, and that will walk into the purpose and the plan that God has for my life. So every day when we wake up, every time that we're reminded of what we've done or what we said or how we used to be, we have to remind ourselves and do like David and encourage ourselves in the Lord that God is greater than the sex that I have. He's greater than the drugs that I've done. He's greater than alcohol. He's greater than everything in my life. And that's the good news of the resurrection because Paul, Paul now experiences a resurrection in his life because the Bible goes on to say, the Bible goes on to say in chapter 9 of Acts verse, verse 18, as he's going through this transformation, it says instantly something like scales fell off Saul's eyes. And he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Yes. I told you that when you're not walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're, you're spiritually blind. You may be able to see. You may be looking, but you really don't have clear vision until the scales fall off your eyes. All right. Now Saul has a spiritual awakening. Now Saul has a resurrection in his life. Well, he realized, I know what I'm done. I know what I've said. I know how I've behaved. But Jesus is greater than that. Yeah. And he's given me the opportunity to experience a resurrection in my own life. Yes. So that he can be able to use me to get his message out. Yes. Yes. Saul, who was zealous in killing believers, passionate about killing believers, makes a transformation to, to Paul. And becomes one of the greatest evangelists in the Bible. Who goes forth. And stay the gospel of Jesus Christ. He testifies in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. He says this. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me. Because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Wow. Verse 14 says, Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and the love that came from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me. So that, Jesus, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of, the, of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Yeah. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him yeah. and receive eternal life. Yeah. In other words, Paul testifies in 1 Timothy by saying he identified himself as the chief of sinners. He says, if Jesus, through his long, long suffering, through his patience, uh -huh. through his love, for me, was able to save me, Paul, the chief of sinners, certainly he can be able to save you. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly he can be able to save me. If he was able to transform my life, right. surely he can be able to do the same thing Amen. in your life. And that, my brothers and sisters, is what the resurrection is all about. 
that we realize that there is nothing that you that we can do to be able to earn salvation, but that we receive it freely from Christ. Right. Right. Not of our own doing. Not of our own merits, not of our own knowledge. But he woos us with his love and draws us with his long suffering and draws us with his patience. Paul says, if he was able to save me, certainly he can save you. Yes. Here it is. There is no sin. There is no mistake. There is nothing that you may have done. Nothing that you may have said. Doesn't matter how much porn you've watched. Nothing <laughs> is too far for Jesus right. to be able to reach you. To reach you. That's it. Right. There is no sin that is too big in your life that he can't rescue you. There is no trouble that you may have caused. There is no trouble that you may be in that is too big for Jesus to be able to reach you right where you are. What encouragement from 1 Timothy. Paul says, me being the chief of sinners, received his mercy, received his grace. And if he was able to do it for me, surely he can do it for you. As the musicians are playing softly, there's someone, there, 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 there's a group of people in this room right now. That you have allowed your past in your mind to be greater than the love of God for you. There are people in here that you have allowed your mistakes, all of that stuff, to be greater than the grace and the mercy that's available to you today. Listen, I pray that the, that the scales fall off your eyes right now. That you can be able to see and hear the love that Jesus Christ has for you through his word. You're not that bad if he could take Saul and transform his life. You're not that out there. You're not that wild. You're not that loose that God cannot get you and transform your life. And no matter what you've done, no matter what others have said about you, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. God has a purpose. God has a plan for your life. And he desires to use you. Yes, you. Pastor, you don't know what I've done. It does not matter. He wants to clean you up and use you. Pastor, you don't know what I've said. It does not matter. He wants to clean you up and use you. As our ministers and elders and deacons are coming now and our prayer team is coming. We want you to experience your own resurrection today. Pastor, what do you mean my own resurrection? You mean I got to go on the cross and die? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. 